action in our feature match area. Let's head down there right now for round four of Grand Prix Lyon. Hello and welcome to this round four of Grand Prix Lyon. I'm Tim Willoughby, joined by Matei, Big Z Zadelkai, and we have the number eight ranked player in the world, Martin User, Hall of Famer. He's got more Grand Prix <laughs> top eights than almost everyone, currently tied for second in terms of all-time uh, Grand Prix top eights. Uh, and it looks like he's on Tron, kicking things off with others' power plant and an expedition map. Looking at Anders Gottfredsson, though, starting things off with Spybala Canal and playing a Serum Visions, there's quite a few different decks that he could be on here. Yeah, he could be, but I see a desperate ritual in his hand, so I assume we're going to see a gift storm on his side of the board. I'll, I'll immediately start with a small story. The first time I've met Martin Uza was him casting uh, uh, Tron pieces in standard wow. a very long time ago, and that's when I first time noticed. I think he finished in the top 16 of uh, GP in Brussels uh, quite a long time ago, and since then, he's kicked on. Three Pro Tour top eights, 28 GP top eights, five of them wins, and Hall of Fame, of course relatively recent Hall of Fame. Looks like there's a sleight of hand as the follow-up here. Look at the top two. One goes in the hand, the other one going on the bottom. And for this matchup, how would we characterize it, uh, Mate? <laughs> well, I think the one who's on the play is uh, in a, in a, has a big advantage. Now, Martin Yuza being on the play and having the access to turn three th Tron thanks to uh, the expedition map, if he can land a Karn here, he can probably disrupt Anders enough to survive and uh, um, maybe find a way to win the game uh, just by you know getting rid of um, all the lands or start disrupting his hand, maybe landing a big threat like an Ulamog or something similar. Uh, otherwise, if he hadn't done this, Anders would be pretty free terrain. These decks don't really interact that much and Anders just wants to uh, play out a bunch of lands and get some rituals going and uh, win the game with a huge grape shot. So we'll see if Martin has the card and he does and he's going to go for the land right away. Turn three Khan, immediately minus three loyalty, exiling one of the lands in play, and this very much means that Anders Gottfriedsson needs a lot of things to go right. He does have Boral Chief of Compliance in play. That will make all of his spells cheaper if it gets to hang around, but Martin User has the option of simply finishing off his Khan in order to deal with another threat on the other side of the battlefield, and he still has that seven mana available to him thanks to the three Tron lands, and of course potentially whatever else he can get going. Yeah, he still has to be quite careful. If he, if he has a replacement Karn, he could easily uh, minus here, then play another one. And I think he has one, but he's probably thinking if uh, maybe he can do some more damage. I think he has seen Oblivion Stone as well. Uh, he just has to try to disrupt Anders as much as he can, because especially with the Boral in play, the Storm deck doesn't need that much to go off if, he ha if it has the right cards. Yeah, Instance and Sorcery is costing one less to cast. Typically, if it worked out that Anders untapped here with Boral in play, he would be able to start playing lots and lots of spells very cheaply, generating a lot of mana with his rituals and so on and so forth. But there we see it's a combination of Khan Liberated getting rid of a land, Oblivion Stone getting rid of that Baral, and that meaning that now Anders Gottfriedsson just the one land in play, and that makes life a little tricky for him. Yeah, so Martin is just try was trying to go for the probably the most disruptive way, uh, because generally Oblivion Stone is not that great here, but if, if he can use it to get rid of uh, the Baral, it's fine. He also minus the Karn, because I think he has another another one left in his hand but I, i'm uh, i'll be keen to see if he if he plays it if he goes for the minus on the Baral, or if he's going to go after that Shivan Reef on Andres' side. Yeah, I guess one option, if you can cut your opponent off an entire color of mana it makes it very difficult for them to go off. Meanwhile, Baral it just generates so much extra mana over the course of a turn when you're casting a lot of spells some of which in turn themselves generate mana. Mm. There's definitely a temptation to get rid of it where you can. So throws a chromatic star. And that one just indicating there's still uh, a colorless mana floating. And I, he's going to use that, presumably probably generating green mana here, I would imagine. Yeah, I would imagine as well. I'm getting, I'm getting small uh, flashbacks here. 
uh, to one of the GPs who casted a few few years ago. But yeah, you see the Karn uh, getting rid of the Baral. Thing is, I saw Chad like turn three Tron Karn GGs. You know, the chat was full of GGs, but it isn't as clear cut because Storm is a deceptively powerful deck uh, in this regard. That it doesn't re need many lands to operate, especially because of Electromancers and those uh, uh, Baral's. They really enable you to go desperate the ritual metamorphose and just keep going up the chain but i think at this point anders has depleted a lot of his resources and he's now using the metamorphose to dig him into something i don't think he found it yeah you can see uh, dice on the table this will be anders gottfriedson just trying to make sure that he can represent how much mana he's got what his storm count is there's a lot of moving parts going on in terms of what uh, the Got gottfriedson storm deck has going on and he's in this slightly unfortunate position of having to do something here. One option I guess he has available is if he can play uh, Manamorphose into a Ritual into a Grape Shot, he could mm -hmm. kill off that Khan. And yes. if there's not anything else from Martin User, he may still be in a position where he's able to finish things out. Yeah, it doesn't go for it, doesn't do anything here and just passes the turn. And now Martin User can also start working on the hand of Anders with the plus on Karn being a, a pretty big deal here. So much loyalty, and this the disruption is just going to keep continuing. And look at Martin's hand. He also has a worm coil engine in his hand, as well as another Oblivion Stone. He has plenty left in take, maybe even a walking ballista. Yeah, I like the idea of getting some kind of a threat onto this battlefield, forcing the issue a little bit in terms of time, so it's not just a matter of Khan whittling away resources, it's life totals going down as well. Yeah, and uh, what M uh, what Martin uses thinking about, he is actually thinking about minusing on the Shivan Reef, again real uh, recognizing that there's still a threat of Anders theoretically uh, could it go land Electromancer and keep the chain going, so he just wants to restrict the lands as much as possible and now he's going to add the Vermcall engine to the board, and he probably recognized that he can kill uh, Anders maybe two maybe three turns okay he's gonna go for a small walking ballista that he can pump up in one of the previous turns yeah it's it's gonna be a, a tricky selection of draws that are gonna be required for anders to get out of this mm. obviously step one he needs to find some land um and then even having done so he then almost certainly needs a way of reducing the cost of spells in his hand and then rituals plus Ideally, either passed in flames or gifts ungiven, just so that he can generate a large spell count for that ultimate grape shot that closes yeah, things out. I think he has like triple desperate ritual in his hand. That's a, that's a lot of mana that he can work his way up to. Now, with walking ballista on the battlefield, if Martin User can get it up to having three counters in total on it, it does make the plan of playing either a Goblin Electromancer or Baral much much harder. Exactly. He's going to pump it up. Yeah, it's going to go up to three. Uh, yeah, a 3-3, three, three. so swing for 9, and I think, yeah, is he basically presented a 2-turn uh, clock with his uh, with his walking blister and worm coil engine, plus, as you said, rightly so, finding a way to disrupt uh, if there was another Electromancer. But Gottfriedsen found uh, Steam Vents, takes 2, but he might as well try to go for it here. Yeah, I don't think there's any value in waiting. He's essentially dead next turn, so he kicks things off with a desperate ritual. Does not have enough mana left over to splice, but three red in pool there, represented by that red dice. Thank you very much for the clear signaling there, and uses four mana to cast desperate ritual, splicing on another desperate ritual. So he's up to six red mana, but no blue mana, crucially. So he's going to have to do this the hard way, yep. if you will. He does have a, uh, some past and flames in his hand. Now he's trying to explain to Martin how the splicing works. So he adds the fourth mana to his mana pool and plays Desperate Ritual with the splice. So and once that resolves, that's six mana. And he still keeps one of the Desperate Rituals in his hand. So that's going to move him up to seven mana. And so seven red mana, though, in the, in the pool. And now with the past and flames. So all the cards, uh, all the instant sorceries in his graveyard should have a flashback. And here comes the hard part. He's definitely going to be able to generate a happy amount of mana here. That one, each ritual is essentially plus one mana, plus one storm. Yep. So, okay, there's mana. Finally, a way for him to get some uh, some blue mana here. So two red and two blue. Now, Goblin Ooh. Electromancer normally would be a fantastic thing to play here, but he's looking at that walking ballista. Mm. Essentially, Goblin Electromancer. It's storm count, but nothing nothing else really because. 
the best that he can hope for is that he has it in play and can then respond to walking ballista with some instant speed ways of mm -hmm. making the most of its ability. Yeah, so what he could do is play the Electromancer and then immediately play Manamorphos from his graveyard because that would generate him an extra mana out of the Manamorphos, but the problem would be he, had to, he would have to invest two mana into the Electromancer itself, so it's not that good of a trade here. I think Martin is going to shoot it down at, as soon as he gets priority. So... In, res in response to that desperate ritual, here we see uh, Walking Ballista doing his thing. Yeah, so as, as you see, Anders went for, for a spell from his graveyard. And uh, in Martin just stopping him, like, I do want to get rid of the... Oh, we go with Electromancer, but then Anders with mana left floating in the pool, he can respond to, to the Walking Ballista uh, activation. It's all tricky uh, stack game going on here. Something that we don't get to see that often. I love it. I mean, this is yeah, so this is a much more entertaining storm game than the one where it's just all easy. And look at what Martin's doing. Martin's like, I'm going to shoot the Electromancer once. Then in re now in response, Anders is, is uh, putting the Manamorphos on the, on the stack. And now I think Martin is going to shoot it, shoot it again. Yeah, ideally he still wants to kill that Electromancer before the Manamorphose resolves. Uh, like already, yeah, uh, he already managed to um, to put stuff on the stack, yeah, but he managed to uh, get the Electromancer off the board and now the spells are going to start resolving that he put on the stack. I think so, it was one Desperate Ritual and one Manamorphose. And you saw there the Manamorphose generating two blue mana, drawing a card, the uh, Ritual generating three red mana, because that's just what it does. Yep. Um, so we're at 10 Storm already and 6 mana available. Mm -hmm. uh, Serum Vision's getting played from the graveyard. Yep. It's so all instants and sorceries get flashback thanks to Past in Flames. But crucially, it's the ones that are in the graveyard at the point that you cast the Past in Flames. If future spells uh, go to the graveyard later in the turn, mm -hmm. they do not have flashback yes. until you maybe cast another Past in Flames, you flashback another Past in Flames, yeah. that sort of thing. I, I, a lot of people in the chat are asking about how the stuff works with the, with the Electromancer and it's very complicated because of the way priority works and how, we, how uh, it happens and, and now that Anders is thinking about uh, resolving Serum Visions other card I can explain so Anders played the, uh, the Electromancer he still had priority so he could play a one mana Desperate Ritual from his graveyard in response Martin shot, uh, shot the Electromancer with a Walking Ballista of once just one damage he wanted to have the resolve and in response to that uh, since it was Anders' turn he could play the Mana Morphos from his graveyard for one mana and then Martin decided to kill it off because Anders didn't have any more responses so it resolved from the back to the front so that meant that uh, the Electromancer died then the Desperate Ritual res uh, sorry the Mana Morphos resolved for two blue and a card then uh, one of the damage of the Walking Ballista fizzled because the Electromancer was already dead and then the, mana, uh, then the ritual result for three red mana and that's why he, ha he had three red and three blue in his pool now a bit less blue after all those serum visions now the other thing worth noting about that entire sequence of plays at the, at the start of the turn Anders was on eight facing a worm coil engine and a walking ballista on three the walking ballista's gone now which means that actually he's no longer facing lethal on mm -hmm. the swings this coming turn so even if it works out that everything goes as poorly for him as it possibly can he may get a second chance at going off with this deck if he can't quite find a way of piecing things together but it's really interesting watching a storm go storm deck go off like this where it doesn't have everything that it needs because actually these are the moments where you find out who the great storm players are mm -hmm. that are able to navigate their way through the choppier waters and still piece together the win. So, uh, interestingly enough, now Anders is out of blue mana and his hand is mostly uh, blue spells. He does have another ritual, but he actually didn't manage to go off because he has zero grape shots. He was up to 12 storm and just couldn't find a way to finish off the game. He at least got rid of the balking ballista thanks to those electromancer shenanigans, but now he's facing off against uh, not just Wormco engine, but Martin used at 32 life and needing to get that engine rolling again with uh, with the storm kind which is going to be much difficult with already so many of those manamorphoses and rituals exiled yeah it's interesting uh, a lot of the time uh, when it comes to counting storm count for these storm decks getting to 20 isn't actually as hard as it sounds like it ought to be um, very frequently it is possible to uh, just when you're going off generate so much storm count that it's almost mm. a, a bit of a nonsense um, yeah 
Getting to 32, Storm, now we are in a, a difficult spot. Yeah, the, the one other alternative is to find a way to fire off two Grape Shot, but it's still, you need 16, Storm, and Grape Shot, and then uh, maybe uh, Flashback, uh, Pass in Flames, or play a Pass in Flames to play uh, the Grape Shot game from the graveyard. And Andres didn't find any Grape Shots at all, and uh, just ran out of mana trying to dig for it. I believe that he had put one Grape Shot to the bottom of his deck with a sleight of hand, and there <laughs> haven't been any shuffles. One thing that you'll note from Anders Gottfriedsson, thus far he's not played fetch lands, and this is actually one of the versions of Storm that we see, is people playing fetchless Storm that means that they have a little bit more life to work with, and actually they can, um, they can rely on their library manipulation spells in a slightly different way. They... Uh, this is a deck that I know Simon Gertzen is very keen on mm -hmm. because he feels like the, the quality of draw spells feels a little higher when you know that you're not forced to shuffle your <laughs> deck from time to time just to make your mana base work out. Sure. I, uh, I think yeah, uh, Chet's saying also another interesting thing about the, the Storm deck. It can also Grape Shot and then remand the Grape Shot and play it right away. So it's another way. So th it has quite a few ways to get even past those high to life totals who, for people who think like... You just need to get to 20 storm and uh, and uh, try to finish off your opponent from 20. Even uh, high life totals are not always an issue. If you keep going, it usually means that you had to had to stick a electromancer or bar baral or both mm -hmm. and just try to turn through your deck and uh, generate huge amounts of mana. I I thought I saw a demon fire in his uh, in one of the exit cards, but might have been uh, oh no, it actually might have been a past and flames with a different art. Okay, so Oblivion Stone has been played by Martin User here. That is another way of dealing with one of the cost reduction creatures, either Goblin Electromancer or Boral Chief of Compliance. Three of them already dealt with in this matchup by Martin User, who is keenly aware of the things that he needs to do to stay in this game. Sleight of Hand sees Electromancer and a Manamorphose. Now, obviously, he would love to be picking up both of those cards. Yeah. One of them is going to the bottom, and it is the Manamorphose, because it looks like Anders feels like he desperately needs to get that Electromancer going to either block, you know, that's a reasonable uh, thought, or just um, let him potentially go off this turn. And here we see a divinity counter by the looks of things. Is it, sorry, is it, is it a divinity counter or a fate counter for fate counter, fate counter fate for counters. Oblivion uh, Stone? Um, in order to make sure that that worm coil engine, when the stone is activated, won't be killed off. An interesting option that potentially was available to Martin there, if he had the mana for it, was just to crack the Oblivion Stone, kill everything, and rely on his three three worms to finish things. But this way round, pretty safe. Um, just gets to kill the one creature on the battlefield, attack in, and take game one. So Tron on the play against Storm, able to take things down. He did have natural Tron, he, oh sorry, he did have Tron on turn three, should I yes, say. Yes, yes. Uh, he did have two copies of Khan, but it's, it's amazing to me how even having done all of that hard work, yeah. Tron was still very much in it. Yeah, Martin sorry, had a... Storm was very much yeah, in it. Uh, Martin had a great draw, like turn three Karn into another Karn, as well as a worm call to pressure the opponent and pad his life total a little bit, just to make sure that, uh, that Anders needed a big turn. Uh, but then, like, I really thought Anders was doing it, but I think his Serum Visions and Slate of Hands let him down a little bit. Yeah, he was definitely having to go off on hard mode. Sometimes there's just not a way of uh, mm. working your way through that. Uh, a card that we didn't get a chance to see in that game one, but that I'm pretty confident will be part of Anders Godfredson's list, is Gifts Ungiven. Now, talk us through what that does to the Storm deck and its sort of velocity. Uh, Gifts Ungiven is a pretty important card uh, uh, in this deck, not just because you can make it cheaper with the Electromancer and the Brawls, so you can play the turn three, but it basically just g g gives you the option of getting two really good cards in your hand and two more good cards in a graveyard and because of past and flames the cards in your graveyard are almost like in your hand if you manage to go off and that's why you see Andrew's also having a few different choices he was running basic islands and also a snow card island so you can because you have to gift for well it doesn't have to be four cards <laughs> it can be only two but then they go to the graveyard but he wants cards with different names so that he can maximize his options where, where whichever way he goes and I also quite uh, like the fact that uh, in the last couple of sets we had the reprint of uh, Opt mm -hmm. and you know, also another good addition for to the Gift Storm deck yeah, it's a really interesting deck to play and to watch. Um, sometimes it can feel a little bit uh, frustrating to play against because once they're doing their thing, often there aren't too many ways of interacting with what they've got going on. But you know what? It's 
indicative of what this modern format is that you have decks that can operate on such different axes here. And I'm really intrigued to see how game two goes. Firstly, because this time Storm's on the play, and I feel like that could have been the difference in this first game in terms yeah. of who was able to pick up the win. But also... Um, because now we have sideboard cards in the mix. Yeah, so uh, looking at the sideboard, so I'm looking at what Martin Yuzer can do because he was, I think he was doing kind of well. He has a relic of progenitors that he can sideboard and he has a surgical extraction. I think we're going to see some thought knots here as well. And that's maybe another Wormclaw engine or Ghost Quarter, but none of those scream exciting to me. Whereas uh, Anders, he has quite a few options with... Uh, um, he has Echoing Truth, Empty Two Warrants, Giga Drowses, Pieces of the Puzzle. Maybe if mm -hmm. he wants to get some more cards going, uh, Shattering Speed, wipe away, wipe away, not uh, not as impressive. Uh, yeah, maybe I'm just a little un unfortunate that he didn't draw Romance early in the game. That Those would have been really good at uh, holding off of those cards for a turn and then adding him a card. So, yeah, we'll see. It's definitely going to be interesting. But now that Andres is going to be on the play, I, I would favor him. Lovely stuff. And it looks like these guys just finishing up their sideboarding. You see Martin Yuzer just checking that there were 15 cards that he's putting back in the deck box. They don't <laughs> have to be the same 15, but they do need to be uh, 15 cards in that sideboard at the start of every single game. Yeah, and it's always better to be safe than sorry. Mm -hmm. Always, If you're going to tournaments, always check when you're sideboarding that you're putting back 15 cards into your deck box. It's something that we saw. We saw a Pro Tour champion... Uh, with a slight misstep at the, at the Pro Tour, uh, Luis Salvato, in his last round of the Swiss, had a slight misstep when it came to forgetting to de-sideboard after a match. Again, something to just pay attention to. Any one of us can have those little momentary mental lapses, and in a high-stakes environment, that can, be, uh, that can turn your tournament around, uh, pumping the brakes on how you're getting on. But these players drawing up to seven. Hopefully, we'll get them to see them start off with a full seven cards each. Let's see... It looks like Martin also brought in the spatial contortions. I think I already saw one in his end. So that's uh, a way to deal with the, those electromancers and borals. Nice plus three, minus three effect. Looks like players thinking about keeping now. Oh, that, that was a quick pop-up of that card. All right. So yeah, he easily has access to colorless mana thanks to the Tron land. So he can play it fairly early. It's one of the few ways he has to interact with the, with the Storm deck in the early turns because the Storm deck can go off without the Electromancer or Boral, but it's just so much better when you have it. Yeah, if if the Storm deck has a, pl a line of play, which is turn one, do something that involves drawing cards and manipulating my deck. Turn two, play one of the creatures that reduces costs, for example, Goblin Electromancer. Then on turn three, it has the potential to simply win the game. Yeah. Um, I say simply, there's not a lot of spells <laughs> involved, but ultimately... It, it is able to go off without too much trouble if it, if it is unimpeded in those first few turns. And any kind of way of stopping either of those creatures on turn two is, is buying you at least a turn in this matchup. Yeah, absolutely. So Ancient Stirrings on turn one off a of forest means that Martin Yuzer, the earliest he'll have Tron, is turn four, mm -hmm. but does find a Tron piece off the top of his deck. Looks like Ulmog is still in his deck as a way of closing out games once he has that full Tron in play. Ancient Stirrings kind of one of the, the pieces that really moves you towards playing green in your Tron lists. It makes it so much more consistent finding the cards that it needs. And Goblin Electromancer in play on turn two. <laughs> yeah, Martin Newton not hesitating. Yeah, kill it off before your opponent untaps so there's none of this playing spells in response nonsense going on. Sleight of hand again from Andrew Gottfriedson here. Season Opt, uh, that one of the relatively new additions to the Storm list. And it looks like it might be the card that's getting played this very turn. Opt, of course, originally printed in Invasion and a very welcome return in Rivals of Ixlan. Yeah, I love reprints myself. Oh, right. he found another Boral, plays another tapped land uh, in, in uh, Steam and setting up for next turns. Uh, we see the hands. Uh, actually, Anders was not in any danger of going off on his turn. He had a... Uh, he had a bunch of uh, he had a bunch of uh, rituals, uh, but only a slate of hand as uh, cards to dig. So, uh, but Martin, of course, he can't risk it. He has to kill off the uh, the electromancer right away because Anders could have a gift in his hand or possibly a lot of you know a grip of full of uh, relevant cards. It really doesn't take too much, even if having seen his hand there wasn't too much. If he'd drawn into a manamorphose, the manamorphose for one mana generates mana, draws you into something else. You can very quickly start chaining things together and. One of the talents in, in Storm players is knowing both when to go for it. Mm -hmm. I, normally the turn before you're about to die. <laughs> um, 
and then how to go for it, how to sequence things, how to make sure that everything uh, works as best as it can, even in the face of some disruption or other. Yes, there's a relic of progenitor is already uh, finding its way through Andres' graveyard, but I think Martin's going to have another untapped land, so he can sacrifice the relic, and now it's another challenge for, for Andres to, uh, if he wants to try to go off here against that relic. Of course, it uh, doesn't have to rely on just the past and flames, uh, it might be more important to get a bra going, but I think is the hand is looking actually quite weak. There's l there is Baral Chief of Compliance and a bunch of rituals and one more land. Now, we we hit that point in the game where Anders has enough lands to work with that I would imagine that he may be considering playing a Baral and going off in the same turn. It's just a matter of he's going to need to find that card drawing and he may be looking at a way of baiting out the activation of that Relic of Progenitus because it does get a little fiddly going off if you don't have the option of casting past in flames. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Martin uh, digging through his deck with uh, more Ancient Stirrings. Finds another Tron piece. It's mine. He also saw a Thought Nuts here that he sideboarded in. Another nice way to uh, disrupt the Storm deck. Still has plenty of cards left in his hand, though. So, user, his game going a little bit slower here, and if I'm in Martin User's seat, there's definitely cause for worry. Mm -hmm. um, your opponent's got lands, they've got cards in hand, and that means that there's the potential to go off, and at the moment, the disruption that uh, Martin User has is one Relic of Progenitus. He's dealt with the first um, cost reduction creature, but he could really do with being able to deploy a little bit more. Looks like he's actually going to play a second copy of Relic of Progenitus, and that's potentially still useful mm -hmm. here. Even if it works out that he uh, has to use one of them to completely do a number on his opponent's graveyard, there's still the potential for him to lose to Anders going over the top and still filling up that graveyard. This way round, that less of an option. Yeah, now I think Martin used a bre bre uh, had a breath of a big sigh of relief there uh, because on four mana you always expect the storm deck to go for gift and given and try to set up for for one of their following turns. But there was no play for Andres Godfrey and now Martin Uza can untap use the two force to find the last Tron piece. That's gonna make give him seven mana and he can play the card that I know he has in his hand. And you can see Andres is a bit nervous when he was going off in game one. He was a little shaking because because he knew that he didn't have what it takes to go off and he, he was kind of like desperate to try to win uh, at that point and now I think he's going to be in a world of hurt again. Now do you actually go for the Khan here because going for Khan leaves you fully tapped out meaning that a potential big turn with Relic of Progenitus offline could happen on the other side of things or do you just wait a turn and play Khan next turn knowing that you also have these safe uh, relics. Yeah, th that's what he was thinking about, but, but at this point, uh, while relic is down, everything is already exiled in uh, Anders' graveyard, and he still has uh, one relic up to at least get one card, uh, put one card away. So I think Martin is, uh, is feeling safe that now he can also try to disrupt uh, Anders' hand, but now it's the big turn. Okay, he found Past in Flames. This, this could be a really interesting turn that we have here. This is the turn for Andrew Scottfordson to try and go off. His opponent is tapped out, has one Relic of Progenitus activation. But I don't... He do, I just think no he, card drawing. He, he just, exactly. He has all the rituals, but he has no card drawing whatsoever. Uh, he, can, he has the Brawl, he has those rituals, a Desperate, Pyretic, even a Simeon Spirit guy. He drew a Pass in Flames, but just has nothing else going on. He needed at least another Serum Visions I mean, or the Gifts. If he'd drawn a Gifts last turn, yeah, that would have been for gigantic. Sure. As things stand, he may find himself in a tricky spot here. Khan already up to 14 loyalty. And yes, if a game got restarted now and Martin had a Mountain and a Simeon Spirit Guide in play, <laughs> that would only be a relatively small pickup but I don't think that uh, Martin really needs to worry too much about having to activate a Khan ultimate just yet yeah so yeah, but now the Khan is slowly working at Anders's hand uh, at this point it's not I wouldn't say it's not that big of a deal but the fact that the relics are up again um, potentially can spell a big trouble for uh, for Andr Anders who needs to needs to draw something very powerful and Martin actually cashing in one of those relics just to draw a card here. I think that he senses blood in the water and is looking for a way of actually killing off Gottfriedson rather than simply uh, treading water a little bit here. Mm. Yeah, because he can't give uh, under un he can't give Anders too much time because Martin probably recognizes that Anders' hand like there's plenty of cards. 
probably some rituals. He can deduce that by the cards that were exiled already by uh, by the car, and maybe he's missing some action. So, uh, as you said, he can't give him too much time. So Sylvan Scrying here. Obviously, Sylvan Scrying in the early to mid game is all about uh, getting Tron pieces, but there are some Tron lists that do run a few utility lands as well. And we can see Sanctum of Ugin there being one of the cards that Martin uses considering here that the land that means that you can get extra value out of having already cast one gigantic colorless threat. Yeah, and dig for another one. Goes for a Horizon Canopy, actually. So another value land. You can cash in for, for more cards. Yeah, user's deck, not one that makes huge amount of use of white mana. It's more just a matter of this is a land that you can sacrifice to draw a card. And that means that while Sylvan Scrying into Horizon Canopy isn't an especially efficient way of drawing cards, it does still get you through your deck. It's, it's doing what you need. And he also has follow-up in Chromatic Star and, crucially, a little bit of mana left over so that he can either crack the star, generate colored mana, do cool things, or activate that relative progenesis if he so chooses. Yeah, but now again, if Andre had played the gift, Martin Yusuf would probably not feel a favorite uh, right away. Casting Gifts Ungiven when you know your opponent has Relic of Progenitus so much more fiddly because the cards yeah. that they choose to put in which zones become a lot more complicated. Yeah, again, just a pass from, uh, uh, from Andres here. More cards being exiled. I think, I, I think Andres has a, a braid in his hand. So that, that pirate ritual getting exiled, it's not been put under card Khan Liberated because you know what, uh, it's only really the permanents under mm -hmm. Khan that become relevant if a new game starts. So that's just the reason for that. Yeah, but maybe Anders is going to try to go for it, hoping that he, he draws some removal spell here because the more time elapses, the more problematic Khan becomes. And now Martin, look at that. Ancient Stirrings, he's digging for some action. No, not much, not much there. I saw uh, some land, some chromatic spheres. Dig, dig, dig. Chromatic sphere does represent another way of drawing a card. Yeah, he's, uh, Martin has so many cards in his hand, it's, it's pretty crazy, considering how much he's churning through his deck. He still can't get uh, much on this board apart from that Karn. All he's got is a Karn on 18. What's a boy to do? Oh, maybe he, f he has a Ulamog already? Or, no, it's, it's just nine mana? Oh, he had one floating, okay. So walking ballista for five. Yeah, this is going to be a big turn for for Anders if he manages to untap. But now he has uh, he has the issue. It's, uh, Martin has tapped out again. Uh, but we remember the shenanigans between Electromancer and, and the walking ballista last time. An Anders can hope that uh, if he plays the braid here on the walking ballista, that he can untap and maybe draw s one relevant card, maybe like a serum vision or, some or something that he can use to start going off, uh, creating rituals. Maybe Manamorphos would be, would be a great card for him. Oh, actually, he goes for the Relic of Progenitus. I think I like that. Um, mm -hmm. it, it is one of the cards that's going to be a big deal in terms of him being able to go off. Serum vision to pick up okay. here. Now... We already know that with so many rituals in hand, Anders is going to be able to generate a fair amount of mana even in the face of this walking ballista. Yeah, I, I'm not, not sure if he has that much love because after that per paretic ritual got exiled with the Karn, he has one, one fewer. And he might have trouble because the Serum Visions was nice, but he only found a, a basic island. On top of his library, I think I see a Spire Bluff Canal and a Sleight of Hand. So he's still quite in quite a bit of trouble, and he can't really uh, put the Brawl into that good of a use. I mean, I guess that next turn, Martin User can tick that uh, Walking Ballista up to having seven counters on it, mm -hmm. which means that it's attacking, taking Anders to 11, potentially, and then it can kill off a, uh, a Baral or a Goblin Electromancer and potentially even threaten to kill it off again on the stack if there yeah. are lots of responses. So at some point, Walking Ballista just becomes a really disruptive element to what Anders Gottfriedson has going on here. Mm -hmm. well, and the, the, more, the bigger problem with those extra turns is the fact that the Karn just keeps ticking up and taking more and more cards. I think that's why Anders actually didn't even play the island that he drew off the Serum Vision because he knows that uh, he wants... He has to select one card that he's going to put on the card. Uh, look at that. Uh, Martin also found uh, a surgical extraction. <laughs> 22 counters on, on Karn. I haven't seen that in a while. 
Now, at, at some point, is there a temptation to restart the game? Is, there's always a temptation. <laughs> Isn't it? Is it, is it? is it a reasonable temptation? Uh, I don't think so just yet. I think Martin's in, in a g decent shape so far. But it's... Oh, look, he's a little nervous himself. Messes up there, drops his, uh, some of his cards on, on the ground. Um, the thing is, whenever you have a, a, a Planeswalker with enough loyalty on him that you can ultimate, it's always a temptation. Khan, at the moment, just doing a good impression of Liliana of the Vale... Uh, one-sided discards and they're getting exiled if it was actually just discard I don't know if Anders Godfrey would be quite so bothered uh, maybe maybe I would be more tempted to restart the game when Anders would be on two and you have the the Simeon Spirit Guide <laughs> underneath the car oh that'd be cute yeah for uh, you know the win with style points yeah. Martin also has that surgical extraction now and surgical extraction potentially a big problem for Anders Gottfriedsson because he really will need to make the most of cards in his graveyard if he's going to go off this turn. Mm -hmm. And seems like he's trying to do something here. So desperate ritual. Three red mana. Um, okay, he's gonna play the land and pass in flames. Okay. So that means that the Abray, the Serum Vision, Disparate Ritual will will have flashbacks. So I think what he wants to do is uh, potentially... Nah, but he doesn't have any mana left, so I, I think this is just a very feeble attempt of uh, trying to draw it. Because I, I was thinking that maybe he could try to do something like this to uh, get to flashback the, the Abray so that he can kill off the Walking Ballista, then play the Brawl and start trying to um, go off but I think he just wants to Serum Visions first. Draws another land, unfortunately for him. There is a Gift, but I think my Gift and a Grape Shot, but it might just be too late. Yeah, this is the turn where uh, Martin User can be attacking for six and doing all sorts of good things. So this is forcing the Abraid from the graveyard to deal with that Walking Ballista. Mm -hmm. So that leaves the Desperate Ritual still in the, in the graveyard, but I think Martin is going to go for... He has some more counters, yeah, up to eight. Shoots Anders down to four. I mean, I, I like the way that Anders has been playing this. He has been able to gradually work his way past the things that are most going to disrupt him going off. And on four life, not too much cause for worry. Just walking Ballista is something that could just immediately kill him. <laughs> yeah, but Martin still, he has quite a few answers in his hand. There's the, the surgical extraction. There's also spatial contortion, oblivion stone. And now he can start digging with the chromatic sphere again. He's looking for a threat. I mean, it has another card in his hand too. <laughs> I'm not sure how strong the uh, desire is to give up on Khan 26. For <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there might be. Um, I guess that if it gets the last card in exactly. Anders' hand. Yeah. Oh no, 26 loyalty card going away. And uh, Martin just wants to, to nab the last card in, in Anders' hand. So it's, uh, it's the Baral. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Riley Knight on, on the card viewer. Oh, good old fractured loyalty. I had good fun with that one. And here's the surgical extraction on Past in Flames. Mm -hmm. Typically, yeah. this deck won't run a full four Past in Flames. Often, it's just a couple of copies in there. Um, but without Past in Flames and with uh, no cards in hand, this is going to be a rough struggle. The, the reason why Martin Yuza did it here, because sometimes you see the, the surgicals in the draw step just to try to get the card out of hand as well, was that Anders actually kept the card on top. So in this way, Martin can force the shuffle so that Anders doesn't draw the card that he kept on top with the Serum Visions. So it's... A new Serum Vision's on top. Draw a card, get to scry a little bit. Going off at this point is going to require a lot of things to go right for uh, Anders Gottfriedsson. Still at least not facing down a clock. Yeah, I, I don't know what he's trying to achieve. He does have a Mana Morphos here, but with the card on, on the board, it's like every turn, it's like the reverse Hovling Mine. Like every turn you're, you'll get a card less. Yeah, th there's going to need to be an impressive collection of spells running on the top of Anders Gottfriedsson's deck to end things here. Yeah, and now I think Martin Yusuf finally drew a big enough threat to finish off the game. I think we're going to see 10 mana and an Ulamog, the Ceaseless Hunger. 
if Ulamog's not a big enough threat to end this game, then quite frankly, what is? Yeah. Anders Gottfriedsson on four life, and he's going to be losing a couple of lands here to Ulamog's ceaseless hunger. The 10-10 cast trigger, removing some permanents. It doesn't even get a chance to attack because that's enough for Martin User to take the game and indeed the match. Now, on the face of things, uh, I would have said that this matchup, before anyone rolls a dice, before anyone picks up their opening hand, looked to me like it could be one where Storm could just sort of get there. Yeah. We didn't really see that play out. And it came down to, in game one, who won the die roll, we saw Khan come down early. In game two, though disruption really coming to the fore from the get-go and we're gonna get a chance to talk to our winner hall of famer martin user down in our feature match area about exactly how that goes soon enough it's gonna be really interesting to see that but before that we just got a few ads don't go anywhere though as we get to show you more magic here from round four of grand prix Leon very soon
Hello and welcome back to coverage of Grand Prix Leon. I'm Tim Willoughby, joined by Matej Alakai, and we're very much in the heart of the pro show right now. And we're going to get a chance to talk to one of our pros down in the feature match area right now. The winner of the match that we just had on camera, Martin User. Hey there, Martin. It's Tim and Matej here. Great match to watch there. On paper, that doesn't look like it ought to be one of your better matchups, but it seemed to go pretty smoothly. I have no idea. I just I just played three Wizardron lands. They gave me a lot of mana, and I played card in every game. That was that was that was that, that was that was my plan. It works out. So yeah. I, I think one of the interesting cards for me watching that matchup was how well Walking Ballista played against what it was that was going on on the other side of the battlefield. Uh, was that one of the cards that you were hoping to draw once you already had Khan going on, or was it all Khan all the time? Yeah, Walking Ballista is actually pretty good. It's so much better than you know Wor Worm Curl Engine, for example, because that's just a six-six dude that you know gains you some life. But that's that's not really what's what's going on in the game. And like Ballista can can shoot down the uh, the guys that make their their spells cheaper, Electromancer and Baral. So it is, it is actually pretty important to, to get it in play with a bunch of counters because then it's really hard for them to start going off. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about a couple of the moments from the second game where you had those double relics and then one turn you tapped out completely, uh, basically with no with, with the relics down. Weren't you scared of like gift and given or like your opponent trying to go off on his turn? A little bit. I, I should have I should have kept two mana untapped. You guys are right. Yeah. <laughs> I realized that the second I realized that the, the, the second I like tapped everything for the ballista, but then I'm like, I I don't want to be like, oh no, I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna keep two mana untapped. Like if I if I do something that I that I already did, did it, I don't want to take it back. And I I also had the the surgical in my hand, yeah. so, so I kind of figured that if he like tries some like desperate move to try to kill me, where he's not very likely to get there, then I still have the the surgical and it might actually be good for me. If he like, you know, empties his, his hand, goes for like a, you know, 10 percenter or something, mm -hmm. because I still have the surgical that, that can, that can, uh, Stop his combo, yeah. basically. One, one, one thing about game one, though, like he was going off. Like, did you think you were dead? Because we thought it was quite unlikely because we saw his hand. Like, what it was like from your perspective? At some point, he has his storm is ten or eleven, and he has six six mana exactly, which is grape shot, remand grape shot. Mm -hmm. But that would have he would have need, he would have needed to remand one of the copies, and that would have been twenty five, and I was at twenty six. So I was wow. like, well, ho yeah. hopefully he doesn't have like another metamorphose or something. Uh -huh. so. yeah. But yeah, like I, I, I did. At some point, I, I, I did get quite scared, <laughs> thinking like, oh my god, am I actually gonna die? Like this game where I'm, where I'm carning from turn three, blowing up his lands, destroying his his creatures every single turn. That was actually pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah, we saw a good game there, but of course, ultimately, it did come down to you all on that one. Khan helping out along the way. Congratulations to you on your win this round. I'm Thank sure you. we'll see more of you in the feature match area soon. All right. Thanks. See you later. All right. Lovely stuff there from yeah. Martin User. Uh, sometimes you just have Khan on turn three, <laughs> and sometimes that works out. Though I think that slightly a sort of oversimplification of how those games went, even though there was Khan on mm -hmm. turn three, there was uh, quite a lot more going on that ultimately swung that match. Exactly. I mentioned it a little bit when we were talking about uh, when we were talking about uh, like uh, the match. I was having flashbacks because I remember uh, at a modern GP, but the Patrick Dickman against Fabrizio Hunter in the finals. Fa uh, Fabrizio played turn three car and didn't blow up the land of uh, Patrick <laughs> Dickman and lost on the following turn. Martin didn't take any risk and he immediately went for the lands. Good stuff from him. Of course, we have got more magic for you. The pro show keeps on rumbling. And in this round four, we do have a little bit more magic to bring you back down from our feature match area. This match is time warped, but let's get a chance to see the decks that are involved in our next match. Oh, so again, another Tron, uh, Tron deck. Seems very, very much similar to what uh, Martin Musa was running. Uh, yeah, a couple of dismembers uh, there on the bottom right, and maybe one Relic of Progenitus in, uh, on the left. A double Ulamog, uh, Cecil's and an Emrakul, the Promised End, on the, on the top end. Tor of Severin has, uh, is trying to go big here. Yeah, when you throw in Ugin the Spirit Dragon as well, lots of things to do once you're generating 7-plus mana a turn, which can happen as early as turn 3. A very powerful list. We've already seen it in the hands of Martin User, but let's see the deck that he's up against in this round. Oh, burn. Sasha Lusha. Uh, we were told that the uh, Magic Online grinder and a uh, traditional burn deck with a couple of Grim Lava Mancers in the main deck. That card has been getting more and more popular as the as the format went on. Uh, but other than that, a traditional uh, burn deck that just trying to uh, yeah burn your face. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that one races out. Let's race back down to our feature match area to find out exactly how that's going to go soon enough. Uh, I guess that 
again it's going to be one of those things of yeah how quickly can you get Tron? Once you've got Tron, what can you do with it? Worm Coil Engine has to be huge in this matchup. Yeah, Worm Coil Engine is probably the most important card for the burn deck to have. All right, let's check out from our round four how this time walk matchup goes. So Sasha Lucia on the left of our screen on burn up against uh, Toraf Severin. Severin, by the looks of things, on a mulligan there, and immediately he'll know what's up when he sees a Grim Lava Mancer on the first turn. Uh, this is actually our second game here. Uh, Severin winning game one uh, against Burn. Uh, we'll find out uh, how he's able to make spot adjustments in game two soon enough. Goblin Guide coming along and attacking alongside that Grim Lava Mance on turn two. Lava Mance are not necessarily known for hitting the red zone too terribly often, but on occasion uh, the uh, Lava Mance certainly doesn't mind getting stuck in if there are no cards in the graveyard to worry about. And the follow-up here is uh, he's getting to suspend a Rift Bolt uh, and... Toralf is just walking past us there. We, we won't spoil anything in terms of results of things, but um, it's safe to say that in almost any situation, he's got a big smile on his face. Yeah, he's, a, he's definitely a fun guy. Uh, uh, great to have around, always positive. And uh, being up a game here in, in, in our time walk match, though, but against the wall firmly, because the, uh, the creatures are the important bit in the burn deck's plan, because they deal damage in the early turns, and uh, sometimes it can be e really hard to recover, even if you have the removal spells, because Goblin Guy just swings in right away, Grim Lavamans can already use uh, some of the advantage, uh, advantage very early on if you don't kill it right away, but Torov had the turn one Chromatic Star, turn two Sylvan's Crying, and turn three he's going to have the Tron pieces all ready to go, but will he have the worm call engine to stop the bleeding? Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, everything that you said about creatures absolutely bang on, Matei, because I guess that most of the cards in Sasha Lucia's deck represent a pretty standardized about three damage. Yeah. That's, that's more or less what we're looking at, but the creatures can represent quite a bit more. Uh, Goblin Guide has already attacked for two. This is four damage from the Goblin Guide, two so far from that Grim Lava Mancer. Uh, sees a Chromatic Star on the top of Toral Severin's deck. That not too frightening. The big question is going to be what is the follow-up? And Idol on the Great Revel, kind of an interesting one. Not so many cards that Toralf's going to play that are going to trigger the Revel if he doesn't want to. But at the same time, it is still a two-mana creature. And here comes the Worm Call Engine. Toral Severin did have it. And now that's a huge problem for Sasha Lusher. There are still some ways to get around it because it's a Death Touch lifelink monster. But you, the, the deck still has uh, Skullcrex. So that can prevent life gain. That's very important. And another thing that uh, Sasha uh, Lusher can do, uh, for example, is uh, block with a creature uh, and then try to kill it before the damage result so that no life is gained on Torov's side. What I have seen uh, uh, by Torov and why I think he might win this game is the fact that he also has nature cl nature's claim in his hand. It's not only he has the, the danger of uh, a big uh, monster coming right away, but if something would happen, Torov can also nature's claim it at any point, gain some life back, and while still having two nice big 3-3 three, three artifact creatures. Yeah, 3-3, three, three, as much as most of the damage that's dealt out does come in packets of three, when Sasha Lucia is pointing too much of it anywhere other than directly at Toralf Severin, he kind of finds himself in a bit of a losing race. Yeah. Plays it a second Grim Lava Mancer, taking two points of damage from his own idol on the Great Revel in the process. And it may well be that he has to completely pump the brakes on attacks here because <laughs> unless he's got uh, that skull crack, attacking is just going to gain Toralf Severin life rather than losing him any. Yeah. There's nothing really from... Uh like Sasha's going, uh, like side going on here because he had just a bunch of creatures, but he didn't really ha have much else. Now it's going to happen. What I talked about, block with the Goblin Guide. Uh, maybe he could have blocked with Eidolon as well. Uh, depends on which he likes. And he's going to kill his own Goblin Guide with the Grim Lava Mancer. So it's not, not great value here. He also looks like has, Torov has a Warping Whale in his hand and uh, a Chromatic Star and the Nature's Clan that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, tough spot for uh, for the uh, German on our left here. Yeah, I mean, this is... It, it's strange. When it comes to Tron, how good or bad its matchups tend to be often actually swing on how easily or... M like, how realistically are they hitting Tron on turn three? And then is the thing that they're casting with Tron mm -hmm. the appropriate threat? Yeah, so now at least the Boros Charm puts her off down to seven. But now... 
Uh, yeah, Sasha is out of cards. That's his last card. He can maybe find a way to still be able to attack. If he draws a burn spell, like ignoring, if Tor of Severin didn't have any cards left in his uh, hand, which we know he does have something, Sasha could actually still realistically win this game if he top deck a burn spell because he has the attack, he has a lava mancer, and uh, a burn spell off the top could also help him win the game. But I think Torov is going to ambush him with that nature's claim. Yeah, nature's claim could be gigantic here. Generating two blockers, gaining him four life, I guess two life because he'd be taking two from the Adelon the Great Revel. Yeah. Um, potentially gaining three more life from one of those blockers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a tough old spot for Sasha Lucia here because the most that he can be hoping to uh, get through here is not all that much. Attacking for two here. Yeah, but we might see something else here from, from Torov. He has to be careful because the, those Eidolon triggers are, are quite problematic. Yeah, really interesting spot here. What happens if the card in Sasha Lucia's hand right now is a Skullcrack? Yes, skull crack. That's that's a card that's really important against these life gain cards, and uh, I will see. It's a tough decision for Torov. And if this is a really really interesting attack step because we could see a flurry of spells here potentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It could also mean if there's something like uh, lightning bolt in uh, in Sasha's hand, uh, uh, he could in response to the nature's claim basically basically finish off the game because he could Lightning Bolt face would put Torah down to four and then when Lightning Bolt, Bolt goes to the graveyard there's uh, two Grim Lava Mancer activation winning as well plus there's the Eidolon trigger that just now happened and resolved successfully Tense. So Nature's Claim still on the stack here any burn spell from uh, Sasha Lucia in that exact spot yep. could have been enough to get there as things stand, though, this is the turning point. So are we going to get two... Uh, oh, here they are. Death, Death Touch and Lifelink Worms. Also, Toral Severin suddenly on 9 life. <laughs> Eidolon of the Great Revel does not win that fight any day of the week. And now the, he's going to try to kill off the Lifelink one. Makes sense to me. Maybe. Oh, it was just a swift spear. Ah. Now, interesting that he didn't play it before combat. He was really trying to conceal his hand and uh, put Torov into a tough situation of his own. So ancient stirrings. This will be a good way of piling on the pressure. Worm coil engine likely to be the pickup. Yep. There he is. <laughs> the second worm coil engine. Potentially the one that gets Sasha Lucia here. Yeah, he's That's keeping it running. Another Urza's power plant. So three mana left open with that Urza's tower still. Now he also has a Thought Not Seer in his hand still, but that Vorm Call Engine is so, so important. And uh, that's how Tron sometimes operate. You know, playing against Storm, you draw two Karns. Against the Burn, you draw two Vorm Call Engines. Well, that's where you want to be. And we may see a play here at the end of turn from Toral Severin. And he's thinking about the, the Warping Whale here. Could exile one of the Grim Lava Mancers or the, uh, one of the Swift Spears. You, you might just save it for later. There are definitely spells that you're looking to potentially deal with with that one. Uses, plays and cracks a Chromatic Star. Draws into Expedition Map. As we saw with uh, Martin User's match, there are a few utility lands that are potentially worth picking up here. And... Apparently, we're watching an eggs match. It's all <laughs> all yeah. sorts of artifacts that sacrifice to uh, generate mana. Yeah, but he only found uh, an expedition map and a silver scrying. The scrying he's going to play because he had some mana floating. And conveniently, I mean, if he fetches a tower, then he's kind of up on that. And <laughs> as things stand, it looks like he's looking at a Sanctum of Ugin or maybe even a Ghost Quarter here. Oh, okay. Interesting choice. Severin. He's in, in that nice position where he has lots of options. Um, on 12 life against this burn player, that's 
probably a fairly safe place to be, and he knows that he has the potential to gain six more this turn. Now, he's picked up a Ghost Quarter. Why do you think that that might be, uh, Matei? Maybe he wants to um, make sure that uh, Sasha will not have access to green mana for whatever reason. It could be something like an Ancient Grudge Flashback or, or similar. I guess Ataka's command is also yep. sometimes in some of these lists, and with four creatures on the battlefield represents quite a bit of damage. So here comes Warping Well on one of those Grim Lavamancers. Yeah, the Lavamancers are, are really annoying because for, uh, for Torov because, as we saw before, Sasha can always try to find a way to block and then uh, uh, kill his own creature so that Lifelink doesn't resolve. And I think he's going to try to do it here as well. Yeah, so block with the Swift Spear and then kill it with his own Lavamancer. It's really, this is a weird match. Like, Sasha Lusher keeps ki killing his own creatures, and uh, Thoreau Severin also doing the same with his Nature's Claim on the, on the Runko engine. Unorthodox plays, but it's something that you have to do sometimes if you want to win. Yeah, I, I would say that these are the advanced level plays that we really come to see from players that understand their decks and their matchups very well in modern. Uh, this is not something you would necessarily characterize either of these decks as trying to do, but on occasion, there are the appropriate spots for it. And right now, Sasha Lucia, he's having to deal with a bit of a spotty draw against a fairly powerful Trondor. And so whatever works is yeah, what he'll do. Exactly. So maybe you're thinking that, well, this game's over. But still, Sasha could find a way to, uh, to find a way to win. Maybe, like, you know, one Skullcrag here, Grim Lava Mancer activation there. Right? He just drew a uh, Lava Spike. That's certainly not enough. And Toro Severing moves up to 4-0. Lovely stuff, and the good news is the pro show is still going. We have yet more magic to bring you. We're going to get a chance to catch our game three from our third match in our feature match area. Let's head back down to the feature match area and see Elliot Bousseau. He's on Abzan against Matthias Martins with Burn. We've got kind of a gradually sort of threading story here as we get to see s uh, the same decks but in different matchups. <laughs> and here it's Monastery Swift Spear as the first creature down, and. Abzan has a lot of ways of dealing with creatures. I'll be interested to see how much damage Mateus is able to get through in this matchup. Careful though, this is not just any Abzan deck from Elliot Busso. You, did you expect Elliot Busso to come up with the vanilla Abzan? No, sir. I already, he was in the feature match area the previous round and I was quite uh, entertained by him having in play a Siege Rhino. Lovely stuff. Uh, that'll, I, that'll teach the burn players what's going on. Exactly. I also uh, talked to Frank Carson about it. Uh, Elliot Busso also running. And offends are the foremost. All right. <laughs> I can dig it. So it's not traditional abs, and I would call it abs and aggro, but uh, here he has those like uh, noble hierarchs and things like that to try to accelerate into into the bigger threats here. So he, he chose a slightly different approach. And as is usual for Elliot Busso and his crew, uh, as we see already a Siege Rhino in his hand. Um, <laughs> it's not just him playing, but some of his friends, Samuel Villot uh, mm -hmm. being one of them, a GP winner uh, and a top aider, who they're part of the same, uh, f they live in the same city, they test together, and they figure out a, a really novel approach to the Abzan list yet again. Now, Bousseau thinking very hard about what he, want, he wants to do on the first turn. One of the things that many of the decks in modern have to contend with is the shifting puzzle that is land. Um, when you have access to fetch lands and indeed dual lands that come into play untapped at the cost of two life, things can get pretty messy on your life totals and this is exactly the kind of matchup where you can really pay for that. So early doors we see uh, Godless Shrine allowing an Inquisition of Kozilek seeing Idol on the Great Revel, Grim Lava Mancer and Searing Blaze alongside the land. All of these pretty reasonable cards to take. Where, where's your sort of initial reaction going on this one, Matei? Idol on, inst instantly taking the Idol on there. I don't know what what, uh, what Elliot is running exactly, but I, if I would see this sort of hand, because uh, if you see it's after a mulligan, the Searing Blaze is only relevant if Elliot wants to run out too many creatures, and usually a lot of the times the, uh, these Abzan decks uh, trying to morph into a more, uh, more controlled Polish um, perspective with removal spell, maybe some of the some of the discard spells. He does take the idol on here, and I think it's a good move because on the one of the pre on the next turn he can play a tapped shambling vent and still have path to exile mana up, which he has in his hand. So it looks like Skullcrack the pick up there from Matthias Martins that potentially going to be very potent at some point later in the game. Initially, just swings in for one with that Monastery Swift Spear. No interest in getting prowess just yet. Follows things up with Grim Lavamancer, and there is the Wooded Foothills that Elliot knew about. 
Yeah, and uh, we'll see Elliot try to develop in, in, uh, in the following turns here, but he still has to feel somewhat confident. Another C Drino. It's not the first C Drino <laughs> that gets you. <laughs> you know, funnily enough, in the, in the last round, he finished off his opponent like by playing a C Drino, attacking with it thanks to the Hyrax through reality, reality Smasher. 5 6 Rhino. No biggie. Uh, he was also like playing with his opponent, who was then after the attack down to three, and he's like, four mana, another Rhino. <laughs> Yeah, it's certainly um, one of the cards that saw a gigantic amount of play in Standard and, if anything, a little surprising that it's not seen so much play in uh, Modern just yet. We'll see whether or not any of that changes as the format, as it always does, uh, adjusts to little um, changes either through cards added or taken away by new sets mm -hmm. or indeed adjustments to the restrict uh, to the band list yeah we'll see about that uh for those of you in the chat asking no um jace the mind sculptor and blood bread of are not legal this weekend you cannot play them they become legal on monday yeah looking forward to seeing what they do in this in the format but for now enjoying all of the wonders that modern has prior to them coming along uh, variation of course a lovely thing to see and just a pick up here no use of the fetch land j just yet by Mateus Martins yeah and uh, Mateus uh, kept the fetch land because of that searing blaze in his hand but now he drew a lava spike and uh, he might just uh, decide to go ham here uh, so Elliot is going to take three from the lava spike and he's going to swing it with both creatures I think Elliot's going to want to use that path to exile here yeah the Monastery Sith Spear was already a two-power creature, potentially threatening to be a little bit more depending on exactly how the uh, the turn continued. And Mateus, may well not mind having an additional land in play, uh, gets Elliot Busson down to 12 life here. Yeah, the only downside to playing like this, and I, I think it makes absolute sense to uh, get rid of the creature uh, that deals more damage in that attack. Now Elliot, if he wants to play Anafenza, he kind of cannot because uh, Mateus could just uh, untap, fetch a land, and then a Searing Blaze plus Dream Lava Mancer to finish off the, the Anfenza. But I think he drew a, a good answer of its own in an abrupt decay, I think. If he has a, if he has a green source here, though, he hasn't. Yeah, and this may be where a lot of the uh, long thinking at the start of the game came from. Between uh, Godless Shrine and uh, Shambling Vent, no sources of green mana having to use marsh flats on this third turn to find it and the the cost of um using fetch lands very real in this matchup yep saw doran the siege tower another yep. addition yep. in I this particular <laughs> list which i kind of like <laughs> his list is spicy man i want to see more of what elio Busso is up to uh he does the lightning bolt himself basically with a fetch line and, a, and the temple garden coming I mean, to play untapped but that's just because he really wants to get that uh, groom lava master off the table with uh, with that abrupt decay and he's probably hoping that he can draw a uh, nice untapped line and start slamming those siege rhinos so Mateus martin's actually in a bit of a weird spot here where he has one land skull crack and then the searing blaze that elliot Busso knows about mm. and the, just the fact that elliot knows about the searing blaze means it's much harder for uh Mateus to actually get value out of it it may well be that it's stranded in his hand for much of this game yeah the the good thing is for for elliot though that at least anafenza doesn't die to the to the searing blaze he's probably going to play it here but he, he knows he's not in great shape so far he didn't draw the fourth land he only drew a noble hierarch that he definitely doesn't want to play here so Anafenza might just be uh, a way to try to start pressuring uh, Mateus Martins. Yeah, that life total thus far only troubled by fetch lands and um, maybe that Sacred Foundry coming into play untapped, sorry. Uh, so 18 <laughs> points of life to work with for the burn player and of course the way that this game will go is someone will get reduced to zero. This is not a milling matchup, this is not a poison matchup, this is not the kind of matchup where someone simply concedes to a planeswalker with a lot of loyalty at some point, Elliot Busso needs to find uh, a little bit of uh, damage somewhere in this mix. Absolutely. All right, so, tough spot. Uh, maybe the reason why he doesn't want to play an offense, and he actually looks like he wants to pass here, is that there's a real risk of uh, Martin just untapping and going for double Searing Blaze, which would be catastrophic for, for Elliot. I mean, the scary thing for Elliot at this point, though, and the reason that you know, he desperately wants to be able to cast Seed Rhino that turn, is that he's on nine life, and... Mm -hmm. 
Normally, I think of the damage that each card meets out in burn to be approximately three. Um, obviously, lands don't achieve that, but a lot of other stuff does. While Searing Blaze, he knows right now, is a bit of a blank, he is fast approaching the point where Mateus Martins could just close things out very quickly indeed. Mm. Martins draws a lightning bolt. So, yeah, he's, he's actually, he has nine damage in his hand with the uh, skull crack, lightning bolt and Searing Blaze, but no creatures just yet. Yeah, and at this point, he doesn't care if Searing Blaze successfully kills a creature. He just wants to have a creature to target so that he can get the amount of damage through that he needs. And Siege Rhino now wouldn't look quite so good. As it turns no, out, yeah. uh, that uh, shambling uh, vent was never going to be able to generate damage anyway. Mateus fires off a lightning bolt to the dome. Elia Busso on just six life now. Whew, just the just the land for, for Martins. It's a it's a stomping ground. And Elliot Busso he did draw a fourth land here, but this this is a tense situation here for, for both players. Especially if Elliot would would draw something like an Inquisition of Coastal like here it would be great because it could get rid of the uh, and here's but it's some lethal. responses, skull cracking response, and Elliot already knew about that searing blaze. That enough to close things out. Fantastic finish there. Tense games. I yeah, mean, even even though Elliot Bousseau had a bunch of the the cards that he potentially needed to be able to get out of that, he wasn't quite able to piece it together. That is the end of our round four. We'll be back soon enough with more of the pro show, switching things across to Riley Knight and Simon Gertson. But for now, from us, we'll see you after these ads.